If you will take your Bibles and turn to the Old Testament book of Joshua, if you were here two weeks ago, you know that we're in a four-week series. I wasn't here last week by virtue of being at the Southern Baptist Convention in New Orleans. And just so you'll know, all is well in the SBC, all is well in the SBTC with whom I'm employed, the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. Uh, We had close to 20,000 people in New Orleans at the convention, uh, over 12,000 messengers, some significant decisions were made, uh, but we're confident that the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention is moving forward with the mission to which God has called her and entrusted to her. And I'm, again, so grateful that you're a part of the Southern Baptist Convention, specifically the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. But we're, we're in a, of course, so I wasn't here last week. All that to say, uh, we're in a four-week series uh, talking about now what? Preparing for a new season. This is a new season when it comes to the West Conroe family. And I hope you believe with me that exciting things are in store. Do you believe that? I believe that's why, why, why aren't you here? As we talked about two weeks ago, you don't think that West Conroe is dependent upon one man. It's not dependent upon the buildings or personalities. It really is you. The church, the, the church is you. And so you believe that God is still up to something. And so what we're doing is looking at the Old Testament book of Joshua in this four-week series. And I'm hoping, and I'm praying, and I think you are as well, that we will experience things that we've never seen before kind of like the family that lived out in the country and had never been to the city, never been to the city. But one day they went to town and they went to a high-rise hotel. The father and the son went into the lobby to check in while the mom stayed in the car in front in the circular drive. As the father and teenage son walked in, they saw an elevator for the first time ever. They walked over to it, watched an older lady get on and the door shut. They just stood there wondering what she was doing, how this worked, where she was going. And in about 20 to 30 seconds, the doors opened on the same elevator and a beautiful young lady walked out. (laughs) The father, stunned at this development with his jaw dropped, looked at his son and he said, son, go get your mother. (laughs) Hopefully we will see things that we've never experienced because God is a God who's always working in new and fresh ways as we're going to see this morning. So by way of introduction, we're going to read the first five verses of Joshua chapter 1 and then jump down to verses 10 and 11. I know you've been standing a lot today, but let's all stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Joshua chapter 1, 1 through 5, verses 10 and 11. You can join in in your own Bible, your device, or direct your attention to the screen as I read. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan River to the land I am giving the Israelites. I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness in Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates River, all the land of the Hittites, and west to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. By the way, parenthetically, can you imagine how comforting those words must have been to Joshua as he's taken over the leadership reins from Moses who had been entrusted to that and with that for 40 years. And now God is going, hey, I've given you the land. I'm gonna be with you. You have nothing to fear. Now let's move down to verses 10. 10 and 11. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get provisions ready for yourselves, for within three days you will finally be crossing the Jordan River to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you to inherit. Let's pray one more time. God, I pray in the next few moments that we have together that you would stir our hearts that there would be decisions made today that will affect generations to come. That some dad today on Father's Day, that you would stir his heart to let him make up his mind that for, for himself and his family, they've chosen to serve you, the God of the universe. So I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed and said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 
Let me encourage you to take out your outline. As I mentioned in the early service, the 90% of what I say this morning, you're going to forget when you walk out those doors. It's very humbling and sobering, but write down, take notes, and then I know that, notice that the outline is, is hole punch. I don't know if you, I, I, I preach from a manuscript, and it's got the same size as your outline there, and it's hole punched. I encourage you maybe to make a notebook and begin to journal and take notes as to what God is saying to you specifically during this time of of transition, not only this series of messages, but henceforth as we wait a few months for however long God has before you call your new pastor, but to write down what God is saying to you and then refer to it later on. What we're doing in this series is paralleling what God's people did to prepare themselves for crossing the Jordan River, entering into the land of promise that was promised to Abraham years before. We're paralleling their preparation with your preparation as West Conroe Church getting ready for this new season. When God finally brings you a new pastor. Again, it could be anywhere from six to 12 months. Who knows? But you are preparing yourself for that new season. And we're, I think this is a great time during a, a, a transition, an interim time to, to reset. Uh, we've seen a great leader for 25 years, now retired. God is still going to use Pastor Jay, but this is a new season. And it's a great time to reset when it comes to your spiritual life. Uh, I think the key phrase, by the way, in these early chapters in Joshua is in Joshua chapter 3, verse 4, when Joshua says, look at this on the screen, he says, for you haven't traveled this way before. Now, some of you are thinking, yeah, I've been, I was here when we called. In fact, I talked to a gentleman who's on the pastor search team over 25 years ago who called Jay here to West Conroe. You may have been at a church to where you've gone through an interim season, or you're calling a pastor, or you have called a pastor, but listen, you've never, you've never been this way before, not this way, the, God, the, uh, the, the, the direction that God has for you. So don't you want to embrace this next season with fresh eyes and experiencing God to a greater degree, ready again for some new and fresh experiences. There may be some of you here at West Conroe during this season uh, who may have been a follower of Christ for a long time, but you'd have to admit, you probably wouldn't say this publicly, but your passion for the Lord has run somewhat tepid. Oh, you go through all the spiritual disciplines, you know your Bible, you're a faithful attender, all those great disciplines, but it's been a long time since you've been really excited and passionate about the Lord or what the Lord is doing in this church or in your life. This following quote on the screen is very pertinent to you, maybe pertinent to you, look at this on the screen. The long-term Christian is a struggle of a different sort. Although he may have an instinctive Christian reaction to most situations, his commitment may not be as enthusiastic as the newly converted believer. He or she simply assumes that Christianized mechanisms will work automatically. And this can be very dangerous over a period of time. Thinking Christianly without a regular renewal or an abiding, as we sang about a few minutes ago, of our commitment to Christ leads to a deadness of religion, a boring faith, and ineffective witness to God. And we who have grown up with the gospel of Christ have to be very careful to avoid this. I have witnessed and experienced everything that you read in that quote. As a pastor, just going through the motions, not being vibrant in my walk with Christ. And so I know how that is. So if that's you today, this may be a reset for you as you're preparing for this new season for the West Conroe family. It may be that you're here this morning and you've never really surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that you're not experiencing life as it was intended. As I said back in late March when I was here preaching in view of a call, when it came to the parable of the talents, that we all have this life with which we are entrusted and for which we will one day stand before God and give an account, that you are only fulfilled, truly fulfilled, when you are fulfilling the purpose for which you were created. Some of you may be here and you're trying to find fulfillment in sports teams or some other type of recreation. Who knows what it could be? But you're only, listen, you're only truly fulfilled at peace, experiencing shalom the way God designed it when you are fulfilling the purpose for which you were created. And what is that? First of all, to be reconciled to a holy God through what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. 
It's to know God, to abide in him, to love him, to, to, um, to share him, to, to show him. That's for what you were created. So it could be that through this interim time, even today, that this is a reset for you, that you're entering a new season, a new frontier, because the Bible says that when you give your life to Christ, you're a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. The Bible says that you're born again. So it could be that today is a day of salvation for you, and you're going to make a decision today, whether you're a student or an old timer, that's going to affect generations to come. It may be that you have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. You're experiencing, I mean, there's a passion for you. You're abiding in Christ, but you know that something, God is stirring something up in your life. It could be occupationally. It could be with your family. It could be some type of ministry to which God is pointing you. And you know, there is this crisis of belief that you know God is calling you to step out and, and, and uh, to, to exercise your faith. This might be a, a new season when it comes to that, a new ministry to which God is calling you. It may be that some of you are struggling with a call to ministry, to be a pastor, or to be on staff at a church, or to go into the mission field. God is still wooing and stirring hearts to do exactly that. So this is a new season. Certainly, it's a new season for West Conroe, a new era in, this, in the life of this church to the extent that you're not only experiencing life to the fullest and enjoying the journey, but are expanding the kingdom of heaven simultaneously. That's what this series of messages is all about for this, uh, preparing for this new season, season both individually as a Christ follower, as a member of the West Conroe family, and collectively as the West Conroe family. As I said, we're going to, each of these four weeks, we're going to have a main point and then some sub points after that to follow along. But if you were here two weeks ago, remember the first step in how to prepare for this new season is to what? Is to cleanse yourself, to consecrate yourself. Right after Joshua tells the people, hey, we're getting ready. We're getting ready. Finally, after all these years, we're getting ready to, to go into the land of promise. He says this in Joshua 3, 5. Look at what he says. He said, consecrate yourself because the Lord will do wonders among you tomorrow. I hope you still long for God to do wonders, that you still believe that God wants to do wonders, those things that are inexplicable apart from the hand of God moving in our midst, at which we're going to look this morning. But we've got to consecrate ourselves. We've got to come clean. We've got to loosen our grip on those things in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, those boastful, the, the pride in possessions, and to come clean. And we saw two weeks ago what happens if you don't consecrate yourself. Remember Achan? When God's people were told, when they were going into Jericho, do not take anything that is forbidden and take it for yourself. Uh, but that's exactly what a man named Achan did. He took some of the treasure, he hid it in his tent. The battle afterwards at Ai, they lost severely. I mean, uh, Joshua only sent out, sent out 3,000 troops instead of a potential 40,000. They were soundly defeated. 36 men lost their lives. 36 families were affected, ne affected negatively because of one man's disobedience. God told Joshua when he was asking what's going on, God said, there's sin in your camp. And we talked about two weeks, not wanting to be responsible for God withholding his blessing on this church family because of our individual disobedience. So we begged you two weeks ago, come clean. Consecrate yourself as you prepare for this new season. But what's the next step? as we prepare for this new territory. Here it is. One point, some sub points. You can write this down. You've got to commune with God. Communion with God. First of all, you consecrate yourself anew. You cleanse yourself. And then secondly, you have communion with God. You commune with God. Look at verses two through four of chapter three. After three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God carried by the Levitical priest, you are to break camp and follow it. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between yourselves and the ark. Don't go near it so that you can see the way to go. Here it is, for you have not traveled this way before. When you enter a new season, a new frontier, a new era, you want to make sure that you know the way to go, right? And you want to make sure from whom you're getting your information. You probably heard this before, but listen carefully. 
An Illinois man, an Illinois man left the snow-filled streets of Chicago for a vacation in Florida. His wife was on a business trip and was planning to meet him there the next day. When he reached his hotel in Florida, he decided to send his wife a quick email to let him know that everything was okay. However, he typed in the wrong email address. And his note, his email was directed instead to an elderly preacher's wife whose husband had passed away only the day before. When the grieving widow checked her email, she took one look at the monitor, let out a piercing scream, and fell to the floor in a dead faint. At that sound, her family rushed into the room and saw the email on the screen that said this, Dearest wife, just got checked in. Everything prepared for your arrival tomorrow. P.S. It sure is hot down here. <laughs> So how do you know the way to go? How do you know, as we talked about a little bit ago, all those songs today were so geared and tailor-made uh, uh, toward uh, the message today, for which I'm grateful today for that. But God's people in this story were to follow the Ark of the Covenant. What was the Ark of the Covenant? It was a piece of furniture that was the physical expression of God's presence among his people. Moses was given specific detail and instructions on how that was to be constructed. And the Ark of the Covenant went before the people. Wherever they went through those 40 years in the wilderness, the Ark of the Covenant always preceded them. And you see here the evidence that they were to follow this Ark of the Covenant as it began to, 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 uh, to, as they began to move forward, they were to follow the Ark of the Covenant, but it's amazing, they were to stay a thousand yards behind it. I mean, that's 10 football fields, almost half a mile. They were not to come near it. And it was carried by the priest who were men's representatives to God. And you remember that this Ark of the Covenant, if you know the Old Testament history, that they had a mobile tabernacle that was also, Moses was given instructions for this tabernacle, and it had different areas of, that, uh, of the tabernacle. But in the innermost room, there was a perfect cube room that in which was the Ark of the Covenant. And it sat there in the middle of this room, and uh, it was called the Holy of Holies. This room was called the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies in which the Ark of the Co Covenant sat was separated from all humanity by a veil, a curtain, through which only the high priest could go one time, can ima imagine that one time a year, the high priest would go through the ceremony, the cleansing ceremony. He would make his way through that thick veil, that curtain, and he would offer a blood sacrifice on the mercy seat, which was the top of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, uh, for uh, blood for the forgiveness of his sin and for the forgiveness of his people for yet another year. They were in awe of that Holy of holies, so much so that they would tie a rope around the high priest's ankle in the event that he were to drop dead in the presence of God, they would pull him out because no one was allowed to go in that curtain, through that curtain, into the holy of holies, into the presence of God. Fascinating story. But then remember, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus breathed his last, of course, you know, the tabernacle subsequently became the temple in Jerusalem, had the holy of holies. And when Jesus was suspended between heaven and earth and breathed his last, do you remember what happened to that veil that separated all of humanity from the Holy of Holies? It was torn in two from top to bottom. Not from the bottom to the top as you and I might do it, but it was significant from the top to the bottom to show that God is showing us now we all have access into the throne room of God by virtue of what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. Isn't that an incredible story? that we now have act, we're able to commune with the God of the universe through the blood of Jesus Christ. We're able to, uh, we have the ability to abide in Christ. Look at what the apostle Paul writes about uh, this, about our access and not any longer needing a priest or a mediator between um, God and man. He said in 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and mediator between God and humanity, the man, Jesus Christ. Because of that, those of us who've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, having been baptized by the Holy Spirit, we are now a royal priesthood. We are priests unto the Lord, no longer any need for a mediator. So what does that mean? Why do I bring all of that up in light of what we read in Joshua? Because 
what Christ did on the cross 2,000 years ago, we're not the people who are following a 1,000 yards behind the presence of God, following the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant. We are now the priest. This is one of the most significant truths for us, the priesthood of the believer, that we now all have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. We get to commune, to have a relationship, to talk with the God of the universe, to commune with him. And what does the word commune mean? Look at this on the screen. It means to converse or talk together, usually intensely and intimately. Love those two words, intensely and intimately. Do those words describe your communion with God at this season in your life? We know what conversations are like that are intense, maybe, and intimate. Because could there be any higher privilege than to commune with the God of the universe? I love this quote by Andrew Murray. Look at what he writes on the screen. Who would, after seeking the king's palace, be content to stand in the door when he has invited us to dwell in the king's presence and to share with him in all the glory of his royal life? I mean, come on. Do you have communion with the Lord? Are you now abiding in Christ, realizing that apart from him, you can do nothing? Do you really, would you really confess that you depend upon him? One of my friends who's got a great significant prayer ministry along with Jim Cimbala up at the Brooklyn Tabernacle, he says that prayerlessness is our declaration of independence from the Lord. That somehow we think we can do things in our own strength, by our own power, in our own might and wisdom. So if we're not abiding in Christ, we're not experiencing all that Christ has for us. I know many times people want to know the will of God without knowing God. They don't know him. So let's take this opportunity. I don't know where you are in your relationship with Christ when it comes to communion with the Lord, but can we take this time to confess if we need to and repent and to make, take steps to, to get back into union with him? him. And quickly, what can you expect as a result of your communion with God? We're going to see it right here in this text. Number one, write this down. You're going to be asked to exercise your faith. When you walk with God continually, consistently, God's going to ask you at times to exercise your faith. You see, the, before the Israelites could make their way into the promised land, they've got to cross the Jordan River. Now, I've been to Israel three different times, and I've had... I've baptized people in the Jordan River, and you would think, and it's only probably the Jordan River at some places, uh, it's only from here to that back wall, and you can see Jordan right across there, right across the river, so it doesn't seem that significant of an obstacle to cross the Jordan River to get to the promised land, but at this time, in this story, some scholars say that this river could have been a mile wide. It was at flood stage, we know from this story, but some scholars say it was no less than 100 yards wide. And so here you have probably 2 million people looking at this Jordan River after having just been told, hey, the land is yours, but there's one thing, you've got to cross this Jordan River to take the promised land. You're going to have to exercise your faith. So, so um, it would have been only natural, wouldn't it, for the Israelites who were there 40 years before when they were coming out of of Egypt, when they had another body of water against which they, which they faced called the Red Sea, and Moses was told by God to raise up his shepherd's staff and the waters parted, they could have said to Joshua, hey, hey, just, just do that thing. Just raise up your javelin or your spear and do what we, did, we saw 40 years ago. But God always longs for us to exercise our faith so that we can experience him in a whole new, fresh way. So, God gives Joshua instructions on how they are to cross this Jordan, this raging Jordan River. Look at verse 8, chapter 3. It says, command the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the water, stand in the Jordan. Stand in the Jordan River. Now, you can imagine, they are carrying this piece of furniture that represents God among them. And now they're asked to stand in a Jordan River at flood stage, which, as you know, when a river is moving rapidly and swiftly, it could have taken them down the river. And God said, hey, if you'll trust me, exercise your faith, take the Ark of the Covenant, and stand in the raging Jordan River. 
And then he told them what they could expect as a result of that. Look at verse, beginning in verse 9. Then Joshua told the Israelites, come closer and listen to the words of the Lord your God. He said, you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly dispossess before you the Canaanites, the Hethites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, Jebusites, Termites, all of them, all right? He's going to dispossess all of those when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of the whole earth goes ahead of you into the Jordan. It says in verse 12, now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man for each tribe. And then verse 13, when the feet of the priest who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of the whole earth, come to rest in the Jordan's water, its waters will be cut off. The water flowing downstream will stand up in a mass. Can you imagine again? as a priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant, being told to stand, and here's what God would do. It says, when the soles of their feet rest, not the toes of their feet test the waters. Okay, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna see God if you're gonna, no. They were to take it and to stand. That means to rest, to completely trust that God was going to fulfill what he said he was going to do, to remain. Here's what I know, that when you walk with God, intimately and intensely, he will continually ask you to exercise your faith in him to step out into the unknown and the seemingly impossible. I love Henry Blackaby's quote, Out of Experiencing God. Look at what he writes. He said, God's invitation for you to work with him always leads to a crisis of belief that requires both faith and action. You must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he is doing. And I just wonder, is the West Conroe family, are you ready to to step out and to exercise your faith to believe that God is gonna do above and beyond anything that you can ask or think? And just trust God for what's on the other side. A new pastor, new experience, new ministry opportunities, all these exciting things that God has in store for you. Are you willing as you abide in Christ and walk with him individually and collectively, having been consecrated, ready to see God do that which only he can do, the wonders that he said he was going to do? Because you know what happens when you exercise your faith, when God calls you into that unknown? Secondly, you're going to experience the supernatural. That's what happens. When you exercise your faith in what God has called you to do, you're going to experience only what he can do. Verses 16 and 17, we see the wonder. Look at this, verses 16 and 17. It says, and the water flowing downstream stood still. (laughs) I would have loved to have seen that. Rising up in a mass that extended as far as Adam, a city next to Zarethan. The water flowing downstream into the Sea of the Arabah, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off, and the people crossed opposite the city of Jericho. The priest carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood shakily on muddy ground. Is that what it says? They stood firmly on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan River, while all Israel crossed on dry ground until the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Again, this was no small task, hoarding this group of people across the Jordan River. So they experienced the supernatural. What happens when you totally commit yourselves, when these priests totally committed themselves, then God did that which only he can do. And they went across the Jordan River. You know, they could have tried to devise their own plan when they got there. Okay, we got this raging river at flood stage. Let's, let's build some boats. Let's build a bridge. Let's wait till the, the waters recede and cross over in another season. But they would have circumvented what God wanted to do and what God wanted to, to show them. And I wonder, sometimes we want God to do the supernatural, that which he does, but we're not willing to put ourselves in a position to watch him work, that we do everything in our own might. We're not abiding in him. We're not depending upon him. We don't know him. We don't follow him, but we want God to do those wonders. Remember Peter, the apostle Peter had to actually get out of the boat to walk on water. And I just wonder, what is God waiting to do as we exercise our faith? I mean, two and a half years ago, I had been pastor at Yorktown Baptist in Corpus Christi for 12 years, thought I was going to be there another 12 years. I had things just like I wanted it. 
just like I wanted. Had just turned 60 years of age. Been there 12 years enough to be trusted and, and hopefully loved and respected. But all of a sudden, God comes around and shakes everything up. And says, hey, I got a job for you here at the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, a whole new stewardship. And it took a, let me tell you, it didn't take a step of faith. It took a leap of faith. There are a lot of things that I am not going to disclose. But when we stepped out in faith, we just saw God fill in all the gaps. It's amazing. Just amazing what God did, but you know what? That's what God does. And if you want to see God work, if you want to experience the supernatural, you're going to have to exercise your faith in him. Don't you want to experience that individually as a, as a church body, collectively? Again, aren't you, aren't you ready to see God do the greatest wonder of all? Which is what? People dead in their sin being brought to new life being a new creation, being born again, lives being transformed by the power of the gospel, marriages being restored, prodigal children returning back to the Lord, people set free from addictions and bondage. And you know what? You already have the framework, the ministries, the foundation in which things, things are happening, but can you imagine God taking them to another degree? That's what God does. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to be a part of a church like that. So will you take God at his word, follow him, get your information from him, abide in him? Because if you commune with God, you will exercise your faith, experience the supernatural, so that thirdly, you can write this down, you will extend God's glory. That's right, you will extend God's glory. Remember, after the people crossed the Jordan River, Joshua told a man from each tribe, each of the 12 tribes, to take a stone from the riverbed. And then on the other side, they were going to build this monument. And these weren't small stones or boulders. These were, they had to carry them on their shoulder. So we're talking about a significant uh, rock to some degree. And they were going to make a, a Gilgal, a circle of stones that was going to testify to the glory of God, the power of God in that season. That's what Joshua said. In fact, look at Joshua chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Uh, we, we back up a little bit when it says, when the children come and see this monument, they're going to go, Dad, hey, Dad, what, ha what happened here? And they're going to say, for the Lord your God dried up the water of the Jordan River before you until you had crossed over just as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. This is so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord's hand is mighty. And so that you may always fear the Lord, your God. So that was to the generations. But look at chapter 5, verse 1. When all the Amorite kings across the Jordan River to the west and all the Canaanite kings near the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the water of the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over. They lost heart and their courage failed because of the Israelites. This was going to be their enemy. These are the ones to whom they were going to, to drive, drive out of that land. These are the ones who heard what God had done and they lost heart. Their courage failed. You see, when God works, word gets out. That's what happens. When somebody sees a life transformed by the power of the gospel, they're interested to know how that happened. And that's why we exist as followers of Christ, as the church, West Conroe family here in Conroe, Texas. That's why you exist, to extend the glory of God. This is not about you. It's not about ministries or buildings or location. It's all about declaring the glory of God. This is what the apostle Peter says about you. Look at this. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, when you walk with God, when you commune with God, when you depend upon him and abide in him, he's going to call you to exercise your faith so that you can experience the supernatural and extend the glory of God. There's a passage in the Old Testament, book of Zechariah, where God is explaining to Zechariah the prophet, hey, these are some things that are gonna, remember God's people were in, in, uh, in exile in Babylon. 
And God is telling Zechariah, hey, this is what's going to happen when you make your way back to the land of promise, to, 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 to the holy land, if you will. And in verse 23 of Zechariah chapter 8, uh, here's what we read. The Lord of armies says this, in those days, 10 men from nations of every language will grab the robe of a Jewish man light, tightly urging, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Can you imagine during this time when people all around you in your neighborhood with whom you work, they're in turmoil, they're in chaos, they're scared to death of what they're reading in the news, and they're seeing you as a representative of the God of the universe. And they're going to be looking to you for answers. Why do you respond in a different way at work? Why does your countenance always reflect peace and joy? Why, why do you react differently in the, in, in the office? And they're going, to, they're going to ask these questions, and I can imagine them clinging tightly to you and saying, hey, can we go with you? Because we hear that God is with you. That's why you exist, to extend the glory of God who's delivered you from darkness into his marvelous light. Don't you long to draw attention to our great God, just to give glory to God by what he is doing, to step out in faith and watch him work? It can happen. As you cleanse yourself, as you commune with God and experience all the things at which we've looked this morning. So are you walking by faith? Really, are you walking by faith? Do you depend upon God and abide? This is for what you were created, for union with Christ. Are you abiding in him so that you can see him do that which only he can do? Don't be content to stand at the door of the palace instead of going in and enjoying the king's presence. 